Omori had an art showcase dedicated to the game some weeks ago, and during its seven-day runtime, people discovered some very peculiar unused art. Art that painted the ending of the game in a dark, foreboding light despite its already dreary nature. And it wasn't exactly obvious where in the exhibit this unused art was at first, but after you get past the giant character cutouts and the beautiful canvases adorning the walls, you eventually happen across this. This giant picture of Omori is actually peppered with scraps of unused drawings, and upon closer inspection, you see cutscene storyboards that were almost put into the game's good ending. These are almost certainly Aubrey Kell and Hero's reactions to the truth. It's unclear whether there were plans to have dialogue happen after these initial expressions, but to someone watching this video who so desperately wants closure after the emotional turmoil of Omori's main storyline, you're probably asking, why? Why would such a pivotal piece of narrative information get left out of the final product? Well, if you've seen my other videos about Omori, you might already have an idea, but I think the answer to this question lies partially in the game's final battle, and by extension, the song that accompanies accompanies it. What you're about to hear is what I consider to be the most heart-wrenching song in video games. It's heart-wrenching because of the incredible composition and the haunting use of the violin, but it's also moving because it's built on the backs of the very carefully laid out plot that the player was put through for hours beforehand. Like a knife slipping into your heart and twisting, the violin melody worms its way in and does not stop churning. It's piercing, unflinching, and devoid of remorse. Despite being the last fight in the entire game, it wasn't until briefly before this battle that all of the story's careful omissions of details finally paid off. Since most of your time spent through out Omokato Mori is spent in a fictional purgatory that gives only brief glimpses into the broader picture of what's going on and makes the eventual reveal that much more potent. A good narrative twist has the effect of making sense when you experience the story a second time, and to say that Omori makes more sense on multiple playthroughs is an understatement. Infinitely stretching stairs punctuate multiple scenes, Basil disappearing because he's a loose end that knows everything that happened, and Mari's pictures missing from the photo album are all examples of things you wouldn't know the the context of your first time playing. All of the adventures in the dream sequences were an escape into ignorance, a way to bide time to convince the faraway version of Sonny that this false paradise could be his home, and the idea that this place is too good to be true is interwoven throughout the entire game. Throughout most of your playtime, these two stories work so separately that it can almost feel silly to include them in the same narrative. I am often not a huge fan of storytelling that dangles a question in front of the player for hours before giving the answer, but I think that Omori makes a great case for it, using nothing but a really good payoff that alters your perspective of the past. The question that gets dangled in front of you ends up not being irritating because the player has time to get attached to this world and genuinely wants to know what's going on. If the final boss of Omori being an anti-version of the main character sounds underwhelming to you, I understand. The last fight of an RPG being a non-grandiose husk of something greater to serve a broader point is nothing new, and neither is a game ending in fighting an evil version of yourself. Yet, for as many tropes as Omori uses in its final confrontation, it still feels impactful because the game has spent so much time building up both versions of the main character in their respective worlds. The trope of an evil version of the main character often feels cheap because it's a random implementation into the plot. It usually comes into the story out of nowhere, and the villain just being a dark variant of the protagonist comes off as a contrived way to make us care about this random new character because it's based off of a character we already know. This common trope of storytelling that so often gets misused becomes surprising surprisingly fitting in Omo Cat's game. Omori did not succumb as a message you'll see every now and again in your time in the dream world. It's often used in a hopeful manner, a way to persevere through combat encounters, and it stays that way throughout most of your playtime, yet it takes on a whole new meaning when it's used in the finale. It's recontextualized to show how committed to the denial Omori was, and it's one of the few instances where I've seen a contextual twist like this actually work, a bad example being the fact that EXP in Undertale stands for execution points, like literally 
really why. Omori makes a mockery of living in safety and precedence to the truth. It asks us what non-conflict is worth if it means having to constantly look over your shoulder. The story tells us that whatever happens, there's inner tranquility to letting go of what could happen and braving it so that your heart isn't so heavy. There's a peace to confronting what you've been putting off and embracing the consequences, no matter what they might be. After defeating Omori in battle, something big shifts inside Sunny. Freed from the emotional stranglehold he put on himself, his life with his sister flashes before his eyes, and it lets him finally grieve in a way that's healthy before running across the hallway to let his friends know what happened, but it cuts right before we see the reactions. This does its job of making the player feel like an absolute wreck for a couple of weeks 100%, but while the story works more often than not, it isn't all perfect. For as much as the player is rewarded in multiple playthroughs for understanding the entire context of what's going on, it doesn't change the fact that early parts of Omori on your first playthrough can feel unnecessarily slow, especially with how disconnected the dream world storyline is. It does what it needs to to build up the characters and the relationships for sure, but later on there's a lot of bloat, like the whale section, which tasks you with needlessly long puzzles, almost as a way to pad out the length of the game. I should also point out that unfortunately from a gameplay perspective, the final boss is hardly a boss at all. It's a very scripted, cinematic event. There's no careful juggling of different skills you've learned up to this point, or tactical decisions you have to make using abilities that you've garnered throughout the story. Yes, you do use different abilities, that you've learned, but it's all very on rails and requires little in the way of strategy. I can't express enough how it's still a very powerful moment, but it doesn't utilize the medium of video games to give a unique perspective as much as it could have. But putting all of that aside and going back to my initial question, why did Omocat leave out such important details for the ending scene? Well, the power that the narrative built up over hiding so many important details loses a lot of its emotional impact if the ending is completely revealed to us. It takes imagination and discussion out of the equation. It's incredibly tempting to ask for an epilogue or continuation of Omori that gives us some answers, some closure on how Sunny's friends deal with the ultimate news that Mari did not leave them in the way that they thought, but having it all culminate in something as simple as a reaction would just cheapen everything. If, like me, you feel frustrated not knowing the answer, consider that leaving the story on this dangling thread is partially why Omori has such a strong and emotional following even years after its launch. Our desire to speculate, discuss, and pour over the moral dilemma in all of this provokes interesting subjects of conversation like the level to which someone is worth being forgiven and how on earth did Sonny and Basil get Mari in the tree? Like, actually, what is that? At the very least, I'd like to see some sort of prequel where Sonny and Basil are cultivating upper body strength or something, because despite all the magical bunnies and giant monsters I saw in this game, this was the part that was hardest to believe. I often hear the argument that a sequel would be impossible to make because the ending is so perfect, and I mostly agree, but I think there's several ways another game in the Omori universe could be handled, such as following a different character with their own personal dilemmas, or continuing Sunny's storyline without necessarily explaining what's going on with his friends. There's a lot of great videos on subjects such as this one on Renox's channel. I'll link it in the description. His research into the game has helped me greatly in some of my Omori content. More Omori content will come in the future, so be sure to subscribe.